All right, it's noon. Welcome to uh, UCSF Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Uh, please, you can join us today. I'm Bob Walker. I'm chair of the Department of Medicine. The usual ground rules are here, uh, Zoom in full screen mode. If you have questions, type them in the Q&A box. Uh, and uh, my colleague, uh, Lex Lakshmi Santosh, will be monitoring them and, and pitching some of them to me uh, based on how much time we have. Uh, session is closed captioned. If you're interested, uh, uh, click on that at the bottom. And it will be recorded and available uh, later tonight on YouTube. And let's go to the next slide. Uh, we now have our own new YouTube channel. It is here and through the magic of uh, barcoding in your, on your uh, smartphone. If you take a picture of that, it will take you to, to that channel and all of our grand rounds, both COVID and non-COVID related are chronicled there. And over the past 18 months, we've had, uh, I think we're closing in on 3 million views on our grand round. So uh, very exciting. And I hope you follow us uh, there both for future grand rounds and if you want to look up an old one. So, uh, and, and all of our sessions now will be available for CME. And if you're interested in CME, uh, please stay on after the uh, last speaker and we'll uh, take you to the website to get your credit. Uh, one program note, we've been uh, going to COVID conferences about once a month, but we'll make an exception uh, next week because we have an opportunity to uh, speak again to our old friend Ashish Jha, uh, former UCSF resident and now uh, Dean at the uh, Brown School of Public Health. Uh, so Ashish and I will be in conversation uh, next Thursday at noon. You might want to mark your calendar for that. Well, we seem to have turned a corner in our fight against COVID, but we've turned corners before only to run into oncoming trains. Part of the challenge for us relates to the fact that Delta is far better at its job of infecting people than the original virus was. So our future will be determined in part by the answer to this question. Is Delta as bad as it gets? And, uh, and so uh, part of what we wanted to do today was try to understand variants and how they happened and be uh, a little bit more thoughtful about whether uh, there are more variants in our future. Uh, and then since it seems clear that we're not going to get to 100% vaccination, San Francisco is currently at 75%. Uh, and even if we do get there, there will be breakthrough infections. Another big question that will determine the shape of our future will be the role of testing. Be will we be entering a world finally uh, where ubiquitous, cheap and rapid tests make it easily easy to identify uh, people who have COVID or infectious with COVID? Uh, if you feel a little uh, off in the morning, uh, it's possible that you'll just go ahead and get a rapid test and sort that out uh, and thereby uh, make it less likely you're going to infect other people in workplaces, schools and other public spaces. And uh, with the prospect of effective oral antivirals on the horizon, uh, the stakes of being able to rapidly diagnose people have gone up quite a bit. So those are two, to me, pretty crucial issues in where we stand in COVID in October 2021. And we have two absolutely world-class speakers to uh, address them, uh, one on uh, the role of variants and evolutionary biology, the other on the role of testing. So let me introduce them. And we've divided the session up into two pretty equal halves today. The first half, our speaker will be Paul Turner. Uh, Paul is Professor of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Yale University. Uh, Paul studies the evolutionary genetics of viruses, particularly phages that infect bacterial pathogens. Uh, but he has also uh, done important work during the pandemic, uh, educating many of us, including me, about how variants happen uh, and uh, what variants might be in our future. Uh, his honors include fellowship in the National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the American Academy of Microbiology. Paul, thanks for joining us today. Well, thanks so much for having me. Uh, so like the, second, the second speaker, I'll come back to you in a sec. The second speaker will be Michael Mina. Um, and uh, Michael, uh, who joins us from uh, paternity leave, so thank you, Michael, and congratulations, uh, is Assistant Professor of Epidemiology at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health and a core member of the school's Center for Communicable Diseases, uh, Disease Dynamics. He's also Associate Medical Director in Molecular Diagnostics in the PATH Department at the Brigham. Uh, I think it's quite fair to say that Michael is the nation's foremost advocate for focusing on testing as a key prevention and mitigation strategy. And uh, we had him on probably close to a year ago where we were talking about trying to move things forward with uh, uh, with testing and particularly rapid testing. 
And uh, you must have felt pretty good with this week's announcement from the White House about a major new initiative to support rapid testing. I'm quite confident that that would not have happened without uh, Michael's advocacy. So uh, thanks for that. We'll come back to Michael in about uh, 25 minutes, but let us uh, turn back to Paul and, uh, and talk about variants. So Paul, thanks so much for being here. Wonderful to be with you. I appreciate the opportunity. So I'll go ahead and start my slides if that's okay. Okay, all right. So I'm an evolutionary biologist by training. Uh, I do a little bit of work on SARS-CoV-2, but uh, during the introduction, uh, it was a reminder that a lot of this is falling in my expertise as an evolutionary biologist and virologist. And I'll try my best today to address a question that's on many people's minds. And that is which direction is the virulence of this virus going? First, I have to disclose that I'm a co-founder of Felix Biotechnology, a company that seeks to commercially develop phages for therapy that does not relate to today's content, but I needed to include that disclosure for CME. All right, let's begin here. So um, we were surprised, of course, by the events that uh, we're dealing with today. And the idea is that in the future, maybe we could better predict emergence events by pathogens. That's a very tall order, but of course, it's something we would like to improve upon. Why is it that some pathogens are successful at infecting new or multiple hosts? I mean, that is the core of the matter. These are the pathogens we should worry about. And one thing that I focused on, but many people find to be a popular idea, is that a history, an evolutionary history of having uh, successful infections in a variety of host species creates the possibility for a pathogen like a virus to be poised to emerge on further host species. Now, a lot of this comes through essentially evidence of some of these systems that you're seeing on this slide. To the left, the very familiar one, we know that there are reservoir species that SARS coronavirus 2 and these other uh, coronaviruses of uh, emergence and pandemic potential, um, they have the ability to infect multiple hosts. We know that SIV as a um, precursor to the evolution of HIV in humans, same thing. It's in multiple non-human primates, and therefore maybe it is very easily poised to emerge in uh, a host like humans. And of course, uh, the majority of influenza virus on this planet actually doesn't reside in humans. It resides in uh, waterfowl and other birds, et cetera. So uh, there is the opportunity for all of these sorts of virus systems to be better poised for emergence in the future uh, because of what they do today. Now let's look at that a little bit more, but I wanna start with this diagram, levels of selection in virus evolution. This is what I and my group think about all the time. What you'll see here in this diagram is as you move from the left to the right, there are different ways that you can think about what is important for a virus to make a successful infection and therefore to spread. So there's a real proximate problem of attaching to the right cell type and entering uh, there might be the ability to move to adjacent cell types of the same, but in a multicellular host like us, there could be the possibility of infecting different cellular compartments. And is a virus going to be challenged to do that or not? We have host defenses, especially immunity, uh, that can push back on infections. So this is something that could deter a virus and also select for it to be better at overcoming host defenses. And of course, there's transmission. So viruses need to make it to a new host, and this is something that is going to be positively selected. That's what we would expect. So you can consider all of this happening in SARS-CoV-2 and other viruses, and what can it lead to? As you, again, move from left to right, improved binding to host cellular proteins is something that we would expect a virus to improve upon if it could. Broader tissue tropism, so better ability to infect cells of different types, just variable types or even different uh, functional types as a possibility, overcoming host defenses, especially escaping immunity. And the corollary to that is if vaccines are used, it's escaping vaccines. And also increased transmissibility. If we just assume that it is better for a virus and it would be selected to improve its lot by infecting more hosts over time, then transmissibility should go up. So the idea is when we're looking in the current pandemic, what is the evidence for this occurring? Let's look at a different example though, just for a moment to the side, as this is not an important human pathogen. I'm just gonna use it to illustrate how in some viruses, historically they've improved in some of what you're seeing in the diagram. And what's the evidence for that? 
Vesicular stomatitis virus is an agriculturally important pathogen, and it also happens to be used a lot in molecular virology as a model. So for example, my group studies it. So what's going on in this virus is I think something that's germane to what we're speaking to today. And that is we see evidence in this virus that yes, it enters cells, but in doing so, it can elicit an interferon induction happening in that cell, just like a virus pathogen would, and that's a immune defense. But uh, as that signal goes out to neighboring cells, then they will uh, increase their interferon production because the virus is in the neighborhood, so to speak, and it will better prepare them for the oncoming onslaught. Now, in this particular virus, it has a very good ability across different host species to down-regulate this response. And it is particularly the VSV matrix protein that travels to the nucleus to do this. So what I'm saying is that it is historically important as an agricultural pathogen, infecting horses, cattle, pigs, and even uh, arthropod vectors that move between those individuals because it's able to generally handle host defense. And this is what we worry about with any pandemic virus is that it is poised to be a pandemic virus because it is able to generally do something good across hosts and it was just going to be capable of doing that in humans as well. So now we turn back to SARS-CoV-2 and we certainly are concerned about the variants that are circulating now and uh, what you can see in the inset here is this example of what somebody has placed as, in, in Corber et al's paper here as a global transition as you look to different types of SARS-CoV-2 that are now dominating infection events what do we know about them? We know that they've changed often in the spike protein, and we know the exact mutations that in a sense uh, lead to greater numbers of viruses being produced, greater numbers of infected cell events successfully occurring, and therefore a higher viral load that can also lead to a more debilitating infection. So we already know that uh, for these that I showed earlier in red, I'm transitioning now to showing them in black bold. We know that there's improved binding to host cellular proteins. We also know that there's increased transmissibility. What we'd like to know, and we are gathering the data is, is it infecting different cell types? Is there already uh, evidence that host immunity is not as good against some variants? And in the case of vaccines, is there a greater opportunity for escape? Now, the second half of my, uh, Brief intro here is to think about virulence evolution more specifically, taking into account everything that I just said. What direction is this virus pandemic going to go? Is it going to increase in virulence or decrease? Well, some good news comes from Levine et al., which uh, I'm not going to cover everything that's in the space and literature, but I liked reading this paper because it has a very sound argument for why the evolution of decreased virulence might occur in the system. So their model that was presented this year in science is predicting that the virus could become seasonal with low population level mortality. And uh, there are two basic things that I want you to key in on about this model. The infection fatality rate, or IFR, is the proportion of infected hosts that die. This is a virulence proxy that is strongly dependent on age. We already know this. So the older you are, the greater the probability of a very bad infection and death. The immunity that prevents severe, to be, severe disease is long lasting. That's another key component of their model. And they're taking from this um, evidence from circulating human coronaviruses, but this is something important in their model. But the thing I wanna emphasize is it sets up an age structured system that converges on what's called a steady state equilibrium. If indeed individuals are infected as children, and this allows the immune response to be built with very low, low mortality because children don't die very readily, then you could uh, transition this virus to um, an endemic state where the IFR shown here of uh, a very low amount is something akin to seasonal flu. And how is this gonna happen? If you have a lot of transmission going on along the X axis, and as you have, as you, as you look at that in relation to the waning of sterilizing immunity, per year, then essentially what they're arguing is that without any virus evolution, that essentially this is going to reach some kind of an equilibrium that is more like the uh, well-known circulating human coronaviruses of low virulence and low impact on human uh, health. So a little bit more of this is that the childhood immunity is going to prevent severe symptoms. And uh, when infected as adults, the mortality is not going to be seen. And by contrast, one would say that this should not be expected for SARS-1 and MERS. And that's because virulence in children is so high, it would lead to massive mortality at the population level. And now again, I'm emphasizing that this outcome is not requiring a change in IFR. 
therefore, I'm not saying anything per se about virus evolution yet. But if you go look at this paper, they very nicely illustrate differences between these three coronaviruses with the expectation, and here key in on the y-axis, and the values are quite different on the y-axis across these three panels. But they're arguing across different um, unknowns of the R sub zero, what you're expecting is that uh, SARS-CoV-2 could approach something that is endemic with low impact in terms of mortality in the human population or therefore decreased variance. Now I'll finish up with this story on their paper. Think about when evolution is allowed. And now the role of the infection site in the human body becomes important for the, important for the evolution of avirulence. So let's consider the LRT and the URT, which is the lower respiratory tract and the upper respiratory tract. So when the uh, infection is happening in the LRT, the virus is gonna face strong immune response that causes, uh, and it's gonna cause more damage to host tissues and the transmission to new hosts is limited. I'm not giving you all the evidence on this particular slide for the literature that shows this to be the case, but let's just assume for the moment in my discussion that that is true. When infecting the URT, you get pretty much the opposite. The virus here is gonna face a weak immune response. It's gonna cause minor damage to the host and it's gonna achieve a high transmission rate. So therefore, natural selection should kick in and favor the variants that are infecting the URT, simply because it maximizes transmission and the immunity will build up in the LRT via recovery from natural infection or from vaccination. So therefore, it sets the stage for the expectation of decreased virulence over time. And if we know that the ACE2 host receptor is more expressed in the URT than the LRT, as shown by Ziegler et al. Uh, last year in Cell, then many mutations in the virus spike protein that increase affinity for ACE2 would be expected, and that's what we are observing. And therefore, do we already see the evidence that the fixation of D614G is already suggesting that there's a trend for this virus to be evolving lesser virulence? If I stopped here, I would say, well, drive safely, folks, and that's a good outcome. But the bad news is this. So the increased receptor affinity might not trade off in this particular way. In other words, the lower ability to exploit the LRT, uh, therefore combined with increased transmission and great, I'm sorry, I spoke. So the combining of the increased transmission with greater virulence is indeed a possibility. And that kind of seems likely because the variant alphas, uh, the majority of the genomes uploaded to GSAD since February 21, uh, meaning the average virulence of the world virus population has actually increased. So now I'll end with all right, if we have a head scratcher of a pretty nice model that's telling us that virulence should be likely to go down through evolution, why are we currently observing that SARS-CoV-2 is relatively virulent? So one possibility, it is simply still maladapted. So we expect that with the evolution of greater reliance on human hosts, that there is the possibility for this evolution of lower virulence over time, as I just explained by the Levine model. But as nicely shown here by Alison and uh, Sophonia in the paper this year in Journal of Evolutionary Biology, um, they remind us that newly emerging viruses are often maladapted and further specialization can coincide with lesser virulence akin to that model that I just showed you. But if this is expected, why is it actually not rapidly occurring? Why are we not observing it? So one possibility is that evolution takes paths and selection can work to change traits in any biological system but it assumes that the genetic variability is actually happening through random mutations to make that possible. In this particular system, there could be low genetic variability for what we prefer to be this outcome and what the model is predicting. In other words, any RNA virus is gonna balance its relatively strong mutation rate with the genomic constraints that it faces as having a pretty small genome. It doesn't have that many options with the genes at its disposal. And maybe it's the case that this virus cannot evolve to decrease the immunopathology that it causes because these mutations are just not popping up readily in the population due to constraint. One more possibility that is uh, an unfortunate one is that even if those mutants could emerge to be selected positively like the Levine model was telling us, the selection may not strongly favor them if they occur. And why would that be the case. So in this diagram here at the portion, bottom portion of the slide, this is reminding us that the details of what's called the life history of any biological system can be very important. And what they're reminding us in this Alison and Sophonia paper is that the clinical timeline and the onset of acute illness 
is generally seen after the peak of infectiousness. So in other words, the virus is able to transmit to new hosts before the symptomology kicks in, and therefore we can't uh, rely on the advent of symptoms to prevent the infections that have already occurred. Uh, I'll end by saying that this is unfortunately a bit like what you see in the evolution of aging, where if there were mutations in the human population that are wonderful for fertility and our reproduction, suppose that they have late life effects that cause uh, deadly cancer. The problem is we're done reproducing by the time that that trait is shown. And there would be no selection to remove such alleles from the human population because we're done reproducing by the time that they show their adverse effects. So now the analogy holds here. So we can't expect these alleles that might take the virus to a lesser virulence to be selected for if the virus is done transmitting by the time that the importance of those alleles functionally and fitness wise kick in the way that we would want them to. So I'll um, unfortunately end with this, that the virulence evolution in the system is still a bit of a head scratcher. I think there are wonderful ideas coming about. I was able to touch on a little bit of that work now. Uh, it is certainly a data gathering phase and an interpretation phase that we're in the midst of. So please stay tuned for it. Thank you, Paul. Uh, you came to the answer I give to people all the time, but I don't know anything about it. So. <laughs> it's actually comforting. Um, <laughs> Sorry to say that. <laughs> that's the case. We have, uh, and I actually, the this is a nice, it'll be a nice segue to Michael's talk as we talk about one of the key superpowers here. It sounds like from an evolutionary biology standpoint as well is the idea that by the time you know someone has it, they've potentially already transmitted. That's right. So it's uh, sort of, if I could just jump in, yeah, that suggests yeah. that indeed vaccinate people. The idea is to keep the number of infections down by not letting this occur in very many people, because that's right. always the possibility for evolution to kick in. Sorry to jump in. No, that. thank you. That's great. So we have about eight or nine minutes for questions. I've got a bunch of them. And okay. if others have, sure. please, please uh, do, do put them in. Um, here, you hear the mantra like viruses want to be better at their jobs, but they don't want to kill their hosts. So they don't want to be too virulent. Is that real or is that just like a Hallmark card? That's a Hallmark card. So the, <laughs> indeed, evolution is blind in the sense that it sees what seems to be a good idea at the time and selection can favor it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a great outcome in the long run. And I could give you lots of anecdotal evidence. If people know what an Irish elk is, this is a creature that no longer roams the earth, but it had such amazingly huge antlers that of course it was a sitting duck uh, for predators that might be able to chase it down. So there's all sorts of wacky traits, you know, the peacock tail. I mean, there's lots of things that evolve that don't seem to be a very good idea fitness wise. And there is no crystal ball. So if a virus evolves to a high virulence so that it is very, very deadly to its current host, by the time the, uh, the other selection pressure kicks in to start being a virulent, it, it might even push its host to extinction. And that's not what I think is happening here. But uh, we can't naively think that those kind of anecdotes for what we want to happen are actually true, because there's very little evidence in evolution that that's the way it works. Got it. Thank you. Um, is there some theoretical limit? You know, we, I don't know many people who predicted that Delta would be as infectious as it is. And as we look about at this very cloudy uh, crystal ball about the future, you hear periodically people say, well, you know, it just can't get more infectious than this. Is, is that also a <laughs> hallmark Carter? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that, that has a little more weight to it in the sense of um, one of our listeners today, um, Tom White, I'm not sure he's here today, but he, he brought to my attention uh, an unpublished paper that I, I don't quite remember the authors, but the point is um, if you have convergence occurring in this virus system such that you find similar mutations popping up around the world, independently, then that always suggests constraint. That means that there are a limited number of ways to solve a problem. Otherwise, you wouldn't see convergence as important. So anytime you see constraint in a system, I become a bit hopeful that you can find some way to push on that constraint, constraint and take advantage of it. In other words, if you know the boundaries that evolution is likely to travel in its path, then you can more easily head it off at the pass. And it's just sort of a general statement, but I, I think I would stand by it as relatively true. That makes sense. 
Um, the question of sort of where we stand in the vaccine world uh, comes up in, in, in lots of parts of your of, of your talk. So let me just frame that one in a few different ways. Um, we hear about, you know, you just have to vaccinate more and more people in order to decrease the probability of variants. First of all, is there, are there any numbers there? Like when we get above blank percent of the world vaccinated, does that get us out of the, the soup in terms of risk of variants? And then a second, a second sort of related question, or maybe partly related question, uh, one of our viewers asked, um, if you could do one or the other, if it truly is a, a zero sum game and vaccinate more people with their initial shots or boost more people who truly do have waning immunity, is there a choice there from an evolutionary biology standpoint? Wow, these are awesome questions that I hope somebody are, is modeling uh, these scenarios because I think we have enough data that we could effectively model them. So um, I guess your, your, let's see, your first question was about- Was well, there some, some sort of number, like we have, uh, it, once we're up to blank percent of the world vaccinated, maybe not herd immunity, yeah. but, but blank percent, the probability of a new nastier variant has gone down, you know, really- Yeah, I, I, I think undoubtedly there is a magical number that somebody could predict for that. And it really, the thing that we would have to consider there is the global kind of what's called the effective population size of this biological system. If you push it down to a low enough number globally, if few people are being infected, then it has very little evolutionary potency from the selection standpoint. So it could drift about in mutational space and differ technically through evolution. That way it is changing, but it's not effectively seeing variants that can be of high fitness and spread in a population that is very large in number. Mm -hmm. That's classically in population genetics, the way that something would increase in fitness. And I, I think without having done the math and produced the model, the scenario is plausible that if you push it down to a low enough size, then you know, any biological system should be debilitated for selection. So whether to vaccinate more people or to give the first time or to give them more boosters, great question also. I've not seen anybody model that per se, by now probably someone has, I'm going to hazard a guess that still it's on the side of vaccinate more people uh, rather than you know, rush to give boosters to those who are already vaccinated with the expectation that you'll still have some efficacy in fighting off the infection. If you didn't get that booster, it's not as high as when you were first vaccinated, got your second shot, for example, but it's still appreciable, whereas it is not at all the case of somebody who hasn't seen the vaccine. So um, I hope that made sense, but I guess I'm suggesting that vaccinate more people is probably the better way to go. Okay. Um, I got this question from a viewer, but I had sort of the same version as you were talking about the way we get out of this pickle from an evolutionary biology standpoint. It sounded like getting more kids infected with mild cases, assuming that they don't have bad outcomes, uh, is a really good strategy. I'm sure somebody could hear that and say, oh, let's do that rather than the vaccines. Wow. So how would you weigh sort of the, the, the doing that via vaccines versus natural infection? Is there, are they different from the standpoint of evolutionary pressures? Yeah, I guess they're fundamentally different that if we could give vaccines to kids to mimic that immune response anyway, of course, that's a safer route because they're not going to be debilitated by the vaccine, right? They're not gonna face mortality from the vaccine. Yeah. Whereas the natural infection, uh, that is a possibility. So I was definitely emphasizing the endemic state. So after things have quieted and the model is predicting that an equilibrium is reached, the expectation is it's, it may not even you know, be that worth, well, I'm not so sure they might better back off from that statement. It's more about seeing things at a young age that simply do not do you much harm, but they're present in your environment Mm -hmm. We see them all the time and we don't appreciate them because they're not harmful, right? We don't, we don't care about them. So as we learn more and more about our own viral loads and our virons as young children, I think this is what could come to light in the next few years is what are actually kids carrying around at a young age globally, just in general, being a human walking this planet that may do them some good later on as an adult to fend off. You know, there's plenty of work on that, but it cannot be exhaustive, I mean, because it's so much work to, to do that and to figure it out. But, uh, right. but, but great from question. The but the standpoint of, of, of sort of the mutation pressures and the opportunity for selective pressure to create more variants, it sounds like 
there's not a material difference in whether somebody, a kid get, if, 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 if the kid's getting mild, getting, getting immunity via one or the other, exactly. a, a case or a vaccine, it doesn't sound like there's a material difference in terms of how that would play out from an evolutionary standpoint. Let's say from the standpoint now, from the information we know, I don't think there's strong evidence that there would be a fundamental difference. Of course, as we get, in, get more information day to day, week to week, month to month, uh, some of these statements change a bit, but I think that what you said summed it up accurately. Okay. I periodically get it right just randomly. Uh, maybe the last, last question. Um, so let me just try to pin you down a little bit more on our future. And I understand sure. it's easy, but you know more about this than almost anyone. Mm -hmm. So if you were a betting person, would you say that Delta is so good at its job and has proven in the last six to eight months its ability to outrun all contender variants um, that the uh, possibility of something coming out and taking over, winning in that race against Delta, seems relatively low or that doesn't that that's just too optimistic and all of us wow. want to I, think I, that duck. I, I fully admit that I am an optimist when I can and I kind of share that view so what we often see in model system research and just a whole bunch of evolutionary studies is that when you have a new biological entity in a new environment and selection is kicking in it's improving it will and that's what we have seen however that you know, doesn't often, it's sort of like there's big mutations that will take it to where it is now. And to refine it to be even better, those are sort of harder to find mutations in the universe of possibilities because they just don't increase that quickly because the virus is doing pretty well, thank you very much, mm -hmm. right? So the, the selection kicking in for something that is radically different, I don't see it currently. I don't see the evidence for it. So I think we are struggling through trying to push back the pandemic with this major variant, but I don't really see waiting in the wings something that's going to sweep in and really crush it. Only in the case of if you have some variant that is loaded up with mutations, and this has already been seen. So just because it's loaded up with mutations is very, very different from Delta and might therefore escape immunity. It doesn't mean that itself would be highly transmissible and more fit. And you know, this is this combination of ways that a pathogen is gonna make a living as an infectious agent. And um, the current dominating strain is doing very well. Mm -hmm. And it could be, you know, nearly up there in terms of, you know, I'm choosing my words carefully. It yeah. could be up there in terms of, you know, what we expect, you know, a fitness peak to look like, maybe. You know, and I, I still I didn't like up. that. Maybe the rest of it was great. I didn't like that. Maybe at the end, <laughs> well, well, you know, I have, to, I have to be careful. I understand. I understand. But, no, so yeah. this is all hard to predict. It certainly. All is. right, Paul, thank you so much. I wish we had more time, but I want to make sure we have time with Michael as well. And uh, really fascinating. And thank you for educating us about a really complicated, but thank you so much. critically important part of the world. Really appreciate thank it. You. Thank you so much. All right, Michael, let's turn to you and uh, hear about uh, the role of of testing another part of our of our future and uh, uh, again congratulations on the baby and congratulations on really moving the needle in terms of public policy I think uh, I wouldn't say single-handedly but you had a tremendous amount to do with it so it took a lot little took 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 <laughs> took a year or so but nevertheless let me hand it over to you well thank you very much um, I, I would argue that uh, the needle isn't fully there yet uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that now but um, uh, first, I want to welcome uh, Lila Rose, who was just born the other day, and she is amazing and the best uh, biological experiment yet uh, for me. So uh, disclosures I advise for 4C, which is a, a catalyzer of a number of companies. It includes Detect, uh, which uh, is producing a molecular home-based test, uh, which is different than the rapid antigen test that I have spoken so much about. Uh, and I'm a board member of Quantum SI, which is a protein sequencing company. Uh, so rapid tests have been in the news a tremendous amount lately. Uh, of course, uh, just the, just yesterday, the White House announced a $1 billion uh, 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 investment into more rapid antigen tests. Uh, and this is on top of a $2 billion investment in rapid antigen tests announced during the, with the COVID action plan. Um, and we've just seen 
uh, a real flurry of activity in, uh, in this space over the last couple of weeks in particular, which has really been sort of on the heels of, uh, I would say a 20 month um, campaign to, to get the world to understand that there are different uses of a test and that rapid antigen tests have a, a major, uh, potentially a major role in fighting this pandemic. So the, this was exemplified uh, finally with the pandemic uh, action plan by the president just a couple of weeks ago, where testing uh, has really been a major theme, making tests more affordable, mobilizing the industry to expand the use and development of these tests, sending free rapid tests to homes uh, or to, to locations, uh, keeping schools safe through regular screening, and then of course, vaccinating uh, or testing as a, what I would say is probably more uh, in line with uh, trying to encourage vaccination rather than really creating a, a powerful use of these tests. But nevertheless, it's a, it's a component of, uh, of the plan. Uh, but is this plan enough? So $2 billion and an additional billion announced yesterday sounds like a lot of money. And it sounds like a lot of tests. The idea is to get to around 200 million rapid tests per month by December, early 2022. Um, but in a nation of 330 million, is this really sufficient? Uh, ultimately, this means that over the next year, uh, what it really amounts to is less than five tests per person uh, between now and a year from now, uh, mostly uh, after Delta has run its course. So I don't wanna say it's a little, it's too little too late at all. I think that there is a, a massive need and role for these tests in particular, as we move into a vaccinated era as we move into an endemic era of this virus. Um, what we really need to do is unlock high quality rapid tests that are available uh, around the world. This isn't an issue of scale uh, and it doesn't need to be something that happens uh, in, in five or six months from now. Uh, our peer nations have really figured out how to scale up these tests uh, sufficiently. Uh, for example, in the UK, uh, the government offers free testing uh, to uh, anyone who wants them. You can order boxes of tests for free uh, and with the expectation that people who are asymptomatic use these tests. It is an appropriate use of these rapid tests to control spread. Uh, and that's really what they are pushing for. In Germany, this is just a tweet that, uh, that, that was shared. Uh, you can get a box of 50 tests for, for 37 euros, less than a dollar a test. Uh, and this is very commonly seen. So the US is really a major outlier, both in terms of cost of these tests and uh, access to them. Uh, in the US, we have very expensive tests, which aren't any better than the ones that, are, that cost a dollar abroad or are free. Uh, a lot of the tests still are home collection PCR tests, which as I'll sort of describe, but I won't spend much time on it, uh, is, is not particularly useful for public health to mitigate transmission. And we see just an enormous number of tweets like the one on the top, uh, people driving from, from pharmacy to pharmacy to try to find uh, a box of rapid tests um, so that they can know if they are infectious. Uh, really culminated the summer with, uh, in some ways, with Abbott destroying many of their rapid tests, millions of them, uh, which I would argue is not on Abbott, but is really a reflection of what happens when uh, we place public health fully in the hands of industry uh, that has a, a, their, their first and foremost uh, responsible to their shareholders. And so sometimes uh, public health and, and, uh, and economics just don't work out well. And we need, to, uh, we need to take that into account when we place the, the onus onto the hands of, of industry. Um, this is a, an article not to read right now um, that we just published in the New York Times to talk about rapid tests as an answer to being able to move into this endemic phase of the virus so that we can celebrate our holidays together without fear of infecting each other. Uh, and one of the major goals that I think is, it comes from this article and that, that I've been trying to push, uh, push out recently is that these tests are not medical devices. We evaluate them and we charge for them as though they are. But when the primary beneficiary of a test uh, are the people around the person who's using the test, then by definition, it is a public health tool it's a tool that is benefiting the public, not the test user. If we test a thousand students at a university, for example, this is public health use of a test, not medicine. Having a doctor write a prescription for 100,000 people at a time, which is what the FDA suggests uh, many physicians do on college campuses and such, that is an erosion of the principles of medicine and the purpose of medical prescriptions. Uh, and so I think it's really time that we understand that there is a difference, that there is a use of testing 
where it is for public health in this pandemic and not personal medicine. And it needs to be evaluated and treated uh, very, very differently. And we've written about this in, in a previous paper in Science earlier this year. And so the, one of the, the items that has been so confusing for so many about rapid tests is that uh, whether they're sufficiently sensitive or not. And what I wanna point out with this slide, and I'll show it on a, in a slightly different way in the next slide, is that rapid tests have a very unique ability to detect what matters most for public health, which is to answer the question, am I infectious now? If you can answer that question, am I infectious now, and get the result in a very short amount of time, then you can, that tool can transform into a very, very powerful public health tool that can keep entities safe, both through screening programs at the door uh, to prevent quarantines of students, which is really just an information problem. And uh, that information problem is solved, meaning we don't, we're not certain who's infected and infectious. That's solved with a fast test that answers reliably the question, am I infectious now? The reason that it's been so confusing is because of this continued demand to, to compare a rapid antigen test to a PCR test, uh, where a PCR test is not specific for the question, am I infectious now? In fact, most of the time that somebody's PCR positive is in the post-infectious phase. Most people are positive for somewhere between 20 and 30 days on a PCR test, but only transmissible really for around five or six days or so. And really it's only peaking uh, with transmissibility at, for around three days. And so over 99% of the virus that somebody will have in their body during the whole course of an infection is going to happen in a three-day window of time for the most part. And so what we really wanna do is have the tools that can identify people when they're in that window of time uh, or before and be able to, uh, to stop them from spreading and not isolate people who are no longer infectious and not quarantine the people who weren't actually exposed to somebody who's PCR positive, but not infectious. And so just to put this slightly in, in perspective, normally we show CT values on a logarithmic scale or viral loads on a logarithmic scale, which is on the top here. But I want to just point out, if we convert that to a linear scale, that's what the graph looks like on the bottom. And so this should really point out that if that's your viral load on the top, that's what we normally would measure with a PCR test and things like that. And it's made people think that you might be infectious for 20 days or so. The reality is the vast, vast majority of all of your virus that you're going to have is going to happen in a short burst of time. Uh, it's going to blow through your epithelium uh, your immune system is going to kick in and you're going to um, both increase the viral load very, very fast at the beginning, orders and orders of magnitude in a single day. With Delta in particular, you can go from zero to uh, super spreader levels of virus in a 24-hour window of time. And then you'll drop off very quickly as well. Within a couple of days, you will be orders of magnitude lower again. And so the transmissibility is really uh, in a very short period of time and the rapid tests can do a very good job at identifying these individuals very, very quickly. This is just a slightly different view of this. If we have an individual that is exposed, uh, we talk a lot about infectious or culturable virus, but even culturable virus is on a scale. Uh, you can have a low amount of culturable virus or a lot of culturable virus or just be PCR positive, but no longer infectious. And so this is uh, generally what a viral load curve might look like if you were to be testing somebody every day since they were exposed. You have this enormous burst of viral activity, of viral replication, a lot of transmission for a few days, and then it trails off very quickly and you remain PCR positive for a lot longer. And unfortunately, a lot of the time, the symptoms only start after you're already at peak viral loads. And so this is why we cannot uh, continue to evaluate a rapid test meant to detect infectiousness against a PCR test, in particular when we're talking about asymptomatic people, because if we're doing that, we are just kind of throwing darts. We're taking somebody at some random point throughout their 25 days of being PCR positive, and we're expecting the antigen test to turn positive, but that would actually be the wrong answer for public health. We don't want an antigen test to be positive when you're not infectious. So this has really been a problem with at the FDA. This is how they evaluate these tests against PCR, which is why Americans don't really have access to these tests. And it's why we have so few companies who have been able to effectively skew their clinical trials enough to be able to um, achieve the bars that the FDA has uh, laid forth because an 80% sensitivity 
against PCR amongst asymptomatics is what the FDA asks for, but it is theoretically impossible to achieve without intentionally skewing your clinical trial participants to try to attract just the high viral load people. Uh, and so this is just what I said. So this is where the FDA sort of uh, uh, asks for an, a 90 to 80% uh, sensitivity against PCR um, for uh, symptomatic and asymptomatic individuals uh, and measuring it against a high sensitivity PCR, which is uh, really the wrong, uh, wrong use of, of these tests and the wrong evaluation. And for public health, PCR is the wrong gold standard, I would, I would suggest, if we're trying to identify infectious individuals. This is just a very simple mathematical model that demonstrates that even if you have a perfect public health test, I won't go through the details of it, but I can later on. If you have a perfect public health test that is specific for the infectious window of time that somebody is infectious and 100% sensitive for that as well, then you, amongst asymptomatic, asymptomatics, you should really max out at around a 60% sensitivity when viral load, when out, the outbreak is increasing. And when the outbreak starts to subside, if that's when you happen to do your clinical studies, uh, then that can fall to as low as 10 or 20% sensitivity against PCR, the exact same test that is 100% uh, sensitive and specific for contagiousness. So we have to, we have unfortunately done a very bad job at understanding this um, in our regulatory landscape. And it's essentially barred entry of many tests into the community. Um, so I think that we have a solution. Uh, unfortunately, we've asked the FDA to, to take on an impossible task, and that is to uh, ask the S FDA to evaluate a public health tool when they are only charged with evaluating medical devices. So this really might require executive action, for example, and the president could have something very sensible to say that any test that's used for public health screening during this public health emergency is designated in fact as a public health tool. And that would enable a cascade of new ways that we can evaluate and certify these tests, including looking at the best ones throughout Europe and bringing them uh, on board into the United States based on the European experience with different companies, effectively overnight massively scaling up Americans access to tests and to very, very low cost tests. Uh, and this is just an example of seven different tests that we do not have access to in the United States in part because they haven't been able to achieve, uh, get through the, the, the FDA gauntlets um, or just kind of left because they didn't wanna to have to skew their clinical trials. Um, but what I'm showing here is that many of these tests have nearly 100% sensitivity to detect the highest viral load people who are the most important to detect at the time. And even if they only have a 50% or so sensitivity against PCR overall in asymptomatic people, they're likely over 95% sensitive uh, to detect the people we actually care about for public health. So these tests work extremely well. Um, so I'm gonna dispel three myths. Rapid tests are less accurate than PCR. It is entirely dependent on what you're looking for. Uh, if you're trying to, if, you're, if your accuracy is against PCR and you don't care about transmissibility, then yes, they are less accurate. But if you're trying to do public health testing and you are trying your accuracy uh, target is infectious people who need to isolate now, uh, then, then no, rapid tests are actually the more accurate test. And this has become a big problem with the media consistently. I feel like it's almost law that every article that is written in the media starts out by saying rapid antigen tests are less accurate than PCR. It's just not true. We just continue to um, set the wrong goals. Uh, rapid tests are not accurate for asymptomatic people. I already explained this, that uh, in fact, the, these tests do not care about your symptoms they care about the amount of virus you have. And when, when we find that they, are, they look like they're less accurate for asymptomatic people, that's actually due to a bias um, when we, that we bias people based on when we're sampling them. If they do have symptoms, we have an anchor. We can say, okay, they're closer to their infectious stage. And so it just appears that the tests perform better, but actually they perform identically. It's really about how much virus you have, not your symptoms. Uh, and a test that is not 100% sensitive is dangerous and not useful to stop spread. Uh, this is absolutely incorrect. In fact, at an epidemiological perspective, uh, what we've shown both in science and we have a paper about sen test sensitivity and science advances as well, uh, uh, that showed that even if you only test 50% of people or you have 50% of people just disregard the results or get the wrong result, you can still sever sufficient transmission chains to get R below one and stop outbreaks from emerging in the first place if you have a frequent testing program of say half the population. 
So we don't need a we don't need 100% of infectious people today to become zero with testing. We just need a successful testing campaign. Is 100 uh, 100 infectious people today go on and infect 90? That for most people, if you infect 90 people, that sounds like a failure. But from an epidemiological perspective, that would cause outbreaks to collapse quickly. And uh, and that that those are some of the epidemiological ways we have to think about these tests as public health tools and not medicine. And so I'll give uh, one example of where uh, speed really matters, because I think this is a, a nice example. You could have 100% sensitive PCR test, or you could have a very poor performing antigen test. Let's say it's 80% sensitive. But the PCR test gives results back in two days. The rapid test gives results back rapidly in 15 minutes. You have five infectious individuals walking into a school on the top and bottom, it's the same scenario, except on the top, you have a 100% sensitivity PCR test program. You, you swab everyone before they walk in. You then have those five infectious individuals spend two days walking through school. Ultimately, all of them will be discovered, but that's 10 person days collectively walking around infecting other people. So although it's a 100% sensitivity test, we have to look at the time it takes to get the result and discount the sensitivity and create a new term called, that I call effective sensitivity. Now, if you have an antigen test in this case, which is poor performing and only 80% sensitive, you'll have those same five kids walk into a school. It will immediately detect four of them. So one child continues walking around that's, and then gets another rapid test and is discovered because they get to peak viral load a few days later and get pulled out. That's two person days walking around school instead of 10. So it's very clear just from this simple thought experiment that it is not the sensitivity of alone that matters, but actually speed and frequency of a test program uh, is absolutely much more crucial in every scenario than uh, for public health than uh, the exact sensitivity. Uh, so there are a number of metrics that we should really be focusing on. Uh, I would say that lab-based PCR testing, which has been held up as this gold standard, is really very good for it has a high sensitivity, but it really fails in almost all ways uh, uh, relative to a rapid test uh, because it's difficult to use frequently. It's not necessarily fast. Uh, it's not necessarily easily accessible, et cetera. Um, so there are a number of considerations and I'll leave it at this slide, um, but there are programs uh, to remove quarantines altogether. We have to stop quarantining kids. So test to stay is, an, is immensely important use of these tools instead of telling a whole classroom of children to go home for 10 days because they might have been infectious, we can solve this information problem. We can test them before school for, for seven days. Uh, and if they're negative, they can come into school. Test to treat, we're starting to see therapeutics become much more available. The, the trials are finishing up. We're going to need to be able to start therapy very quickly. So being able to find people who are positive and infectious and, and infected infectious early in the course of their infection when they also happen to be at high viral loads is going to be crucial and getting these tests into people's cupboards so that if they think they might be infected, they can test themselves easily without a high bar to entry uh, is going to be crucial for making these therapies work. And then of course, for schools and businesses to be able to use these tests, we need verification. Uh, the honor principle can work in some settings, the, but it can't work in others. EMED is maybe the only example. There's also, I believe a company which I haven't uh, experienced called Azova, um, but they are, they're, they're software platforms is the point that can, now, um, that can now verify that John Doe is the person who used the test and his test was negative. And this can allow these rapid tests to really become crucial public health tools that businesses and different entities and schools can actually rely on without having to go through all of the trouble of hiring nurses hiring staff to run the tests in their institutions, which generally are too onerous for them to really take on. So we have a lot of different uses and the tools exist. We just have to place strategy uh, in combination with scaling up the tests. So I'm gonna stop there. I'm happy to take questions. <clears throat> Thank you, Michael. And uh, if you have time, we'll probably go over by about five minutes. Is that all right for you? My, my uh, baby's sleeping. It's okay. Good. Fantastic. <laughs> and I, I need to, I did not share this before your talk because I didn't want to distract people, but you tweeted this morning. Sounds like something your family put together for you. Uh, <laughs> let's see if I have it here. 
this is the, the I guess your family calls you Mikey's interview bingo. <laughs> so the question is how many times you you named any of these entities? And I heard I heard a lot of FDAs, and that's exactly right. And <laughs> I thought that was the. Uh, that was very uh, amusing. So let me stop there. <laughs> and, Please don't uh, call me Mikey. That's just yeah, my no, I'm, I, I won't do that. I won't do that. Okay. So we there's so much, so much we could talk. That was terrific. There's so much to talk about. Let, let me get started. Um, I just went to visit my parents, 91 and 85 in Florida. I went to Walgreens, bought a couple of rapid tests, had it in my bag, and didn't use them. And I, my my theory was I was going to use them, like if I had a sniffle or I felt bad. Uh, should I have used it the day I got into Florida, three days before, if I was asymptomatic? What, what would have been the safest and best use of those tests? The best use of a test is always the one used as close to the, um, the event that is taking place. So if you're going to visit uh, family members, then the best time to take the test is right before you visit those family members. Uh, three days beforehand, which is what uh, the CDC and other entities have really suggested for travel and all of this. That's kind of like going to through a security a, a security TSA thing at the airport, and then being allowed to go back home for three days, repack your bags, and then when you come back, you don't have to go through security again. We know that that's not a good way to screen, and so the the test used right before the event is always going to be the much more uh, effective approach. And I think you implied this, but let me just sort of put a point on it. Is there essentially perfect correlation between a positive test and I am infectious and a negative test and I am not infectious? Uh, I wouldn't say that it is 100% perfect, but I like to, I like to put it in, in grades. And so if you're a super spreader, then these tests essentially achieve around 100% sensitivity. If you are somebody who maybe is likely to spread to two other people, then maybe they're hitting around 95% sensitivity, maybe more. But if you're at a viral load that's so low that maybe you can still spread it to your spouse, then maybe they achieve around an 85% sensitivity, for example. So it's not a binary, uh, mm -hmm. but the important thing is when they are positive, uh, barring false positives, which we could discuss, um, is you should absolutely assume that if you're positive, especially if the line is dark, but even if it's very, very light, you should assume that you're infectious, period. Okay. And six or eight months ago, we thought we thought vaccinated people couldn't spread and then Delta became a thing. And then we think it can. And for a while it was the same and maybe now it's less. How what's the overlap between the testing and vaccinated people versus unvaccinated people in terms of test performance and sort of the use of the test uh, more generally in terms of public health? I think this is an example of where we really need to define what our goals are. The president's team needs to define the CDC. The idea that we vaccinate or test in, in workplaces with 100 people or more, for example, which is part of the action plan, that sends the wrong message. That is equating a test, which is meant to identify infectious people, uh, with a vaccine, which is really has its greatest benefits in stopping severe disease. What we've seen as time goes on, not, not surprisingly, frankly, is that this vaccine is not doing a good job at stopping spread. I would actually argue that there's, we, I think once all the data is, is in the dust settles and we might actually find that vaccinated people with Delta have a higher R than unvaccinated people did with the original Wuhan strain. And so I think we just have to be very cognizant that the vaccines are not doing a great job at all at really stopping spread. People can absolutely spread, even if they cut it down 50%, which is good, Delta is much more transmissible than the other strains. And so it shouldn't be seen as a, a vaccination status should not be equated in any way as being uh, unable to spread. Maybe slightly lower risk, but, but it is still important to, if you're going to visit a, an older relative or somebody who is uh, in a more susceptible state, uh, then I would highly recommend, regardless of your vaccination status, uh, to recognize that you can still be carrying very, very high viral loads. And in fact, the viral loads of vaccinated and unvaccinated are, are essentially identical in distribution. Uh, and, and there should be a, a, a real effort to try to understand your infectiousness based on a test, I would say, and masks, you know, other mitigating strategies besides just being vaccinated. So just let's spool that out a little bit in terms of a strategy for a workplace or a school. So you hear of places that, you know, we're going to require everybody be vaccinated. Let's assume it's a trustworthy system and everybody is. It sounds like from your argument would be the value of testing 
as an adjunct to that would be there, there would be value to a testing program on top of that. If I said, I really want to keep this workplace as, as safe as possible, full vaccination is not sufficient a guarantee that you're going to do that. Is that yeah, and I, I, it, that is exactly what I'm saying. But I do also want to emphasize that at some point, and I think I said this you know, a year ago, that society does have to eventually have a hard discussion about uh, at what point do does risk of hospitalization and death decrease sufficiently because of vaccines that we are not counting cases mm -hmm. um, and or as our main metric? And I think until we have that discussion and become comfortable with outbreaks because we're not getting as much transmission, uh, a severe disease uh, through vaccination uh, status, until we get to that point, then I think we have to continue to try to stop spread as much as possible for a number of reasons, including you know, evolutionary advantages that the virus might have uh, as, it, as it bounces around with people's vaccinated antibodies more and more. Um, so I think that for now, testing and knowing your status is going to be extremely important to keep businesses and schools running, you know, at least through middle of next year until we start to figure out what our goals are as a society. Okay. Um, you mentioned Germany and other countries where the, the tests have become ubiquitous. One of our viewers asked sort of what is the actual strategy in those countries? How, how do they deploy these things? Yeah, so uh, I would argue that they have done a good job at getting them out, but not a good strategy about how exactly to use them. But for example, the UK, I showed one slide. Anyone can call up or, or log in and get a box of seven tests for free in the UK any day of the week, um, as many times as they want. Uh, or maybe it's once a day they can get a box of seven for free. So that has been that has essentially reduced any barrier to entry to getting the test, which also makes it much more likely if you're if you're if you know that there's plenty full tests, then you're not going to really have to consider. Okay, I'm going to my my parents' house. Do I take a test today or tomorrow right before I get there? You just take them whenever you feel that there might be a reason to. And uh, so by making them accessible is step number one. Uh, but I would argue that Germany and, and the UK haven't fully created a plan of attack, if you will, with how to use them. Essentially what they've done now is they've built up their armies uh, with large numbers of guns and, and, and soldiers, but not necessarily created the strategy about how exactly to deploy the troops. Yeah, but I'm still struggling with sort of, okay, you know, how do you, when, it, when the test is, you sort of give the TSA example, it's really only good for that day or maybe a day or two, uh, you know, so, mm -hmm. Is it should if I had it for free and it was sitting in my medicine cabinet, I do it every morning when I after I brush my teeth after a while, if they're all negative, I'm going to give up. I, I mean, I That's, don't have the patience. So yep. uh, what, what is the right way to deploy it for in your view? Yeah, so I think that there's a lot of different there, there's no singular right way. It really is context dependent. But let's take a school, for example, or a business. I think I don't want people to be in testing purgatory. Uh, they're not the most fun things. They're simple to use, but they're not super fun. Um, and so what I would suggest very strongly is that we keep an eye on what is happening in your community. If community cases are very low, then maybe rapid testing on a weekly or a twice a week basis just isn't the right approach. Um, but if you start to see an outbreak emerging in your school or you start or you use wastewater surveillance in your community and you start you've had months of no of no detection and then you start to see a slight uptick, then with the flip of a text message out to the community or to the school parents, you can say, hey, we've had a few cases in school. We want your kid to use a test every other day or every twice a week uh, for the next three weeks until we get cases back down to zero. Mm -hmm. And then you can stop again. You know? And so we can really use these as a dynamic approach to testing. Uh, and it's that dynamic approach is going to differ a little bit based on context. And I'm, I'm, I'm working now to sort of create a, a, a uh, a template uh, that people can maybe refer to for all these different scenarios and get that published in one of the major sort of websites. Okay, great. Maybe a couple more questions and we'll quit. Um, there have been a fair number of organizations that gave people the choice of testing, uh, excuse me, of vaccination or testing. Uh, ours, for example, uh, unvaccinated people, we, we hopefully won't have many because there is a requirement, but there are few who are, remain unvaccinated, are, are asked to do the color, a, a, a PCR test twice per week. Does that make sense? Or should we be changing our, these kinds of recommendations to rapid testing? And then the sort of corollary question, 
is for unvaccinated people, you know, some organizations say, or you can do testing. First of all, does that make sense? But second of all, is rapid testing the right test to be offering in that circumstance? Yeah, so we've shown, I mean, it's, it's just mathematically uh, uh, shown now very, very well that when you discount the sensitivity of a PCR test, for the amount of time it takes to get that result back, which is very rarely instantaneous, uh, there is essentially no scenario where the PCR test is the better public health tool if your goal is to limit transmission. Mm -hmm. It's just not like that Like that um, school scenario that I showed with the five kids. Um, it just never really works out in the favor of the PCR as long as it's taking more than say 12 hours to return. Uh, and that's because the delta or the difference between when you first become PCR positive to when you first become antigen test positive is about 12 hours. And so as long as the PCR takes more than that, it's never gonna work out in your favor. Um, for a lot of businesses or the president's action plan, when it comes to vaccinate or test, uh, at this point, I would say it doesn't make sense. It's just not, you know, the, if the vaccine was really reducing transmission 90%, I would say great. Um, but we, we really have to ask, why would we be asking people if you're vaccinating or testing, then actually the people more likely to bring the virus into your workplace are gonna be the vaccinated. Um, and so I think it's very, very important that we are honest with the public about what the expectation of a vaccine, particularly with Delta should be, so that the public doesn't see a breakthrough case that's PCR positive as a vaccine failure, which is what is happening now because they, the CDC and others have said, you shouldn't get a breakthrough case, they're very, very rare. Right. It's not true. And it has caused even more doubt amongst the already doubters. And I think it's just very, very important for us to be crystal clear about what our intentions are with those types of policies. And if they're truly about limiting spread, then the vaccinator test doesn't actually, unfortunately, it really doesn't make any sense at this point. Yeah. Well, thank you. You've educated all of us about about this and done it for a, over a year and very effectively. And congratulations on finally getting some traction here. So uh, hopefully it'll make a difference. And I look forward to seeing your, your plan because I do think this is one of those where even once the light bulb goes on, as it finally has for me, about the value of this test in, 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 and sort of the greater value than the PCR in many circumstances, you're still left with the, okay, now what do I do question? And it's tricky. It really exactly is. Exactly right. I still have my two kits sitting in my suitcase. Now, part of that is because I'm cheap and they cost me 25 bucks. And if they cost a buck, maybe I would have used it. So, uh, but, you know, we really need some guidance on how to deploy these things effectively. Anyway, yeah, congratulations. Totally Thank you. Uh, I, I don't know how we did on bingo, but your, your family will tell us. <laughs> Uh, well, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Paul, for uh, being on today. Really fascinating discussion. Come back next week to uh, to see a uh, chat with Ashish Jha. And uh, those of you interested in CME credit, stay on for a second and you will see how you get it. Thanks so much. Have a great week.